welcome to a very unusual almost adult, very special. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about why this is special, Gage. John Claude's not in the majority of it, so <laughs> it's special. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had uh, some important things that I needed to attend to that day that we were interviewing with her, and rescheduling was a non-factor. So I was absent this episode, which was unfortunate, but I'm sure that, Gage, you have an amazing interview upcoming. I assume? Yes. Okay. We talked a lot about movies, scripts, and we talked about just moving to LA in general. By the way, our guest is Pilar Alessandra from the On the Page podcast. She's been doing this podcast for about nine years, so she is a professional at it. I got to meet her as soon as I moved out to LA, and we've kept in touch, and now she's on the podcast. That's amazing. So, does she talk about a little bit how she got her start? Do you know? She does not, but she talked about why she moved to L.A., and she talked about some weird jobs that she's had along the way. So, it's very interesting. I highly recommend you listen to the rest of the episode. Don't click away. (laughs) Most people, I assume, don't. They probably listen to the podcast, and that's the only thing they do. They just listen to the intro song and are like, eh, whatever, and then they just click to the next one and to hear it again. I just want to hear the amazing voice of Dodge Williams. That's his last name, right, Williams? (laughs) Yes. Okay, good. I wasn't just making up a last name. Yeah, I do actually sometimes do that whenever I show people the podcast because I'm particularly proud of the song I did not write. I just play the song and I'm like, and that's the intro to our podcast. And they're like, what's the actual podcast? And I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, you have to listen to find out. Ooh, some mystery. And speaking of which, listen to the podcast that's coming up. I haven't listened to it yet, so. (laughs) Yes. The format of this is basically... Since I was not present during the interview, I have refrained from listening to it up until this point. So during this intro, I have yet to listen to it. When we do the outro post-podcast, I will come back in and I'll uh, have a little bit of input on what I thought, my thoughts from the podcast. John claude will be listening with you. Indeed. This will be a cool episode. I will join the audience this time, an audience cast. All right. Let's get into the episode. Fucking, it's almost adults. Shit. Almost adults. Shit. We're recording. (gasps) (laughs) I like it because at at the snap of a finger, you turned in instantly podcasty mode. You're like, ooh, (laughs) we're now here at the podcast. I have to get my podcast voice on. How's that? It's so relaxing. <laughs> I think you and my friend Colleen, who I actually think I'm having on next week, has the most relaxing podcast voices ever. Mine tends to get a little squeaky as I get animated, though. Like, it starts off cool, and then it turns into some kind of, like, cackling mess by the end. So watch for that. Listen yeah. for that. Well, I think you're actually getting excited with the audience because your writers always say some really cool things and they're really cool accomplishment or really cool technique and you're like oh yes i do that or yes one of my students did that (laughs) and we get excited with you yeah it is true like doing the on the page podcast is cool for that reason because i get to learn along with everybody it's been i mean you've been listening for a long time but it's been over 460 episodes. (laughs) episodes. <laughs> Think you've done a lot of episodes on this? Wait till you're dead 460. And yet you sit there and go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Or that's a different way in. And that's what kind of keeps me going with that show. Mm, man, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, everyone, we're here with Pilar oh, Alessandra hi. <laughs> of On the Page. Hi. Actually, do you mind if we turn the AC off? Yeah, yeah, I yeah, totally yeah, sure. forgot about that. Okay. There you go. Okay, you can hear me okay? Can we? Can we? Can we? We can. We can. I just turn it all the way down because it distracts me. Sure. So what's even the point of having headphones in the first place? <laughs> we were having this debate a little bit earlier, 
and you're like, I don't think we really need headphones. I, I just, you know, if you're in charge, you just tell me to shut up. I don't like that feeling. I never do. I don't like the feel. I like people telling me what to do. It's like I was born a PA. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. You gotta get I, out of that, man. I know, I know, but I moved to LA really recently, mm -hmm. and I keep saying that. It's been a year. But, but, it, but it always fe just feels like you just got here, right? It does, it does, because you're learning new things every day, you're meeting new people every day. Yeah, and it's sort of also because it's LA and time stands still, which is a beautiful thing when you're my age, you know, like, you're like, I just got here and it's you no know, seasons and everybody who's 40 looks 30 mm -hmm. and hopefully everybody who's 50 looks 40. So, you know, <laughs> Pilar is, um, her age is 18. I am talking to you on the very last week of my forties, which is <sighs> like, you know, when you talk to somebody and go, I could be your mother. It's like, <laughs> no, I really could be your mother. I really. <laughs> And then some, probably. Yeah it's, yeah, it's really, really weird. But like everything I've ever done, not quite as scary when you actually get there. You go, oh, well, I'm still the same person. <laughs> and so far, you know, haven't woken up and, you know, I'm like this haggy hunchback or anything. It's just like, oh, yeah, there we go. That's, that's, that's 50, I guess. We were talking about this last time we met up about basically the concept of almost adults where we are all sort of still growing up in our own way, but we still feel like that same person we were 10 years ago or five years ago. I mean, we might know different people or we might be somewhere else, but we're still the same person, essentially. Yeah, you know, when people go, oh, it happened so quick. Well, it really does. But yeah, one thing I think I've learned is that, yeah, you never stop learning, but also you never really know everything. And there was a decade there where I was like, Hi, I know everything. <laughs> I'm in my 30s, I've gotten married, I have a career, and meet my children. And then I, I turned 40 and I was like, fuck, I don't know anything, <laughs> you know? So that's sort of a, a good thing to know is just like, everybody is faking it, everybody is learning, nobody knows anything. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful story, this has been Almost Adults. <laughs> It's true. Oh, yeah. We've been talking for quite some time. We've hit I'm on... I'm sorry. No. This is... If you've never listened to the podcast, this is all the podcast. Oh, has. okay. Cool. It's just talking to people, just having a good time, and drinking some uh, brewskis. I am drinking a bottle of tequila, straight. Oh, are you purposely <laughs> lying? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pilar, to, I'm purposely make, is lying. Is this to make you cool? Because I have to say, that's just a big lie. That's water right there. But. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking vodka. I'm like, tequila and water are the same color. Yeah, I'm like, I, that's vodka. No. I don't drink a lot, obviously, yeah. yeah. But if I were lying, I would say I was skateboarding outside with uh, some shades on, listening to some Smash Mouth. See, I used to go the other way and be like, I'm drinking water, and I was actually drinking beer on the podcast, but it turned out I wasn't fooling anybody because those were some drunken early days. I do not recommend drinking and podcasting at the same time. Yeah, we <laughs> thought about it. It was like in our consideration, it was in the cards. We we're like, well, what if we did like something drunk for St. Patty's Day or something? And it just never happened. You regret it. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> I guess I am old enough to get, like give advice like, trust me. You know, You're... I regret it. Well, you're definitely old in podcast years because you've uh, been yeah. doing it for nine years. You've yes. been doing it since you were nine years old. That's right. I've <laughs> been doing it for nine years. What happened was, you know, I knew I needed like an internet presence. I knew what was going on at my classes and that they seemed fresh to people. People came in and they said, this doesn't feel like, you know, a class that I took in college or anything. It really feels like I come in here and get things done and I have a good time doing it. And there was an energy in the room that I wanted to convey to the rest of the world. So I knew I had to do that some way, like through the internet, and I was too damn lazy to blog. Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing this podcast, kind of thinking nobody would listen, but people listened because at the time there just wasn't, there weren't really a lot of screenwriting podcasts around. Now, of course, there's tons, and I keep doing it because I enjoy it. But yeah, at the time, I guess that does make me very old in podcast years. When did the podcast thing sort of hit? Because you know a couple podcast people. Right? Yeah, I, there was a, a comedy podcast that's still around and is great. It's called Never Not Funny with Jimmy Pardo. It's a comedy podcast. Jimmy Pardo is my husband's best friend. And they were starting to record in my writing studio. And that's when I was like, well, give me your producer and give me some equipment <laughs> and we got to trade. And they're great. You know, them, you know, Mark Marin was around the same time. You know, it was just this idea of being more transparent, I think, than a radio show. Just 
being able to be more human than a radio show. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why people started to listen. I don't know. I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm not an expert on podcasts. I, I, just, I just host one. I, yeah, I have no idea why people listen to this podcast. I mean, it's unfocused. We just blabber a lot. And sometimes we bring in someone that people recognize. And people are like, hey, I enjoyed this. I'm like, R- R- really? <laughs> you know, I, I think that's the, sort of another thing I've learned from podcasting over the years is, of course, not everybody likes everything, but somebody's going to like one of every show you do. It's going to hit somebody in a positive way. And if it doesn't, then the next show will hit that other part of the audience in a positive way. You know, they listen for different reasons. They catch different kinds of stories. And you just have to do it because you like doing it. You have to actually, that's, you have to do everything because you like doing it. Yeah, that's also an interesting topic. <laughs> kind of finding that line between liking doing something and doing it and being sort of a realist and doing it for profit. Yeah, yeah um, I, I wouldn't do anything for profit. Well, this is probably also coming from a bad businesswoman, but I think it takes the joy out of it. And I really am one of those believers that if you're doing something that you like, you tend to put more work in it, you tend to put more hours into it, and that makes it profitable. You turn around and go, oh look, because I did hard work and long hours, I made money, you know, and that's great. But if you go in the opposite way, yeah, you're gonna hate it. You're gonna hate yourself, (laughs) I think. (laughs) Look out for Almost Adults, episode 212, (laughs) called (laughs) We Hate Ourselves. (laughs) You guys like doing this, right? We love doing this. Like, why? Uh, why? I mean, what, at least I like do? doing this. John Claude yeah. isn't here at the moment. Okay. Yeah, we've been having a good time. It's been going strong for almost six months now. Yeah. And yeah, we have a Patreon up, and we've been doing bonus content, and sure. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. There you go. And one of these days, it'll actually like make money. Mine still hasn't, but <laughs> good luck with yours. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Patreon, but it's like almost a monthly subscription thing that where you get bonus content depending on how much you put towards it. Oh, so I we have are, heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, we are making a little bit of scratch that's on the side. That's awesome. Yeah, that's just paying for the data to be up. But hey, it's a good start. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you had you had mentioned to me like I want to talk about how we met. But you have to refresh my memory. How did we meet? Sure, 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 yeah. So we have to go all the way back to the year of fall 2013. Ah, I'm old. I don't know if I can remember back that far. Okay, fall 2013. I was all the way in Florida, Florida State, and my teacher gave us an assignment. She (laughs) said, listen to this podcast. Awesome. And I can't remember what the particular podcast was, but I believe it was story-driven podcast or idea driven podcast as opposed to a character driven podcast hmm. <laughs> my teacher's like yeah you're obviously idea driven and i'm like oh okay well i guess it's sort of easy to sort of generalize like that you know i think i don't remember that one it was called breaking story breaking story I, yeah and it was the idea that you could podcast from and it's sort of how i start all my classes from event character or premise and all the different kinds of stories that you can tell along the way, like eight different templates or something like that. It might have been that one. It might have been. I'll yeah. put a link into the description. I'm sure I have it downloaded somewhere on cool. my computer. Okay. So yeah, I'll put a link to that. And two years later, the fall of 2015, I was listening to your podcast and you were opening up a contest of a before and after mm-hmm. with all these different subjects. And I thought, hey, I'm in LA, so why not? Mm-hmm. And I think like the grand prize was appearing on your show. And I'm like, I think that'd be awesome. That'd be great. I would love to sort of talk about whatever guest she has on because she always has such fascinating guests. So I entered, I actually wrote a scene from something I'm still currently working on. (laughs) So yeah, old habits die hard and I lost. But it was very cool because you got to read my content on the podcast. Yeah, we and always that... give feedback. So that's sort of the goal of that, those kind of episodes is not winners or losers, but hey, this is some stuff you can do to make it better, or this is why we're, we're not putting you in the next category. But I think you did very well, and everybody loved your name. Everybody <laughs> loved Gage. Like they were like, oh, Gage. Oh, Gage. That's right. I thought you had a good name too, Pilar. Thanks. Pilar Alessandra. Alessandra. That's right. Sounds so. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard so that. So much joke. more exotic than I actually am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. You don't give yourself enough credit, Pilar. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> 
but anyways, uh, yeah, I didn't end up making it on the podcast, but I sent you an email and said, hey, thank you for reading my content. I appreciate your feedback. Is there any way I could just meet up with you and just say thank you and get you a coffee? And of course, being the incredibly nice person you are, you said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just got some coffee and we talked about sort of how we met in the first place. And you're like, oh, you should take one of my classes. And then I ended up doing that and the rest is history. There you go. There you go. It's a, I think it's a beautiful story because <laughs> that's when I first moved to LA. I had no idea how to meet anyone and here you were, just like someone I listened to for the past two years or so. And I just called you up on a whim and you're like, of course, yeah. It never hurts to ask, I think, when you're coming out to this city, just ask. But you want to ask for something that isn't going to... If you had said, hey, would you read my script? Oh, you know, no. I'd be like, dude, I do this for a living and I cannot possibly fit you in amongst everything oh, that. Yeah. I can't do that as a favor. But when you said, hey, could we have coffee or could I just meet you? Of course, sure. So if you, if you come out and you just ask people for something that might be easy, just ask because you never know. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my producers, two of my producers actually became podcast producers on my show because they had done the exact same thing. Hmm. Ryan Butts. Ryan Butts. Same thing. Shout out to Ryan Butts. That's right. And Adeep Desai had brought me in to talk to his organization in Seattle and then came on out here and was like, hey, can I visit? And I put him on the show and somebody liked him and I was like, hey, you should help me produce it. I mean, it was, you know, you should always just ask. That said, I don't always take that advice because I, <laughs> I can be really weirdly shy about those kind of things. But um, Do you have a story I, to go along with that? Oh, no. You know, I don't necessarily because I always found myself in situations where I was exposed to people and making friends even if I didn't want to. You know, I, I, I've never oh, had been I had this other friend on my back. <laughs> well, I was I just, so much friends, life is terrible. I, I didn't go around asking people for a lot of things, but I did go around doing a lot of things that got me in those kind of situations. That I wasn't that shy about because I had to come out here and make money mm -hmm. like anybody else and hated real jobs so I found myself in all kinds of strange jobs that actually lead you to interesting people. Tell me more about these strange jobs that <laughs> you've had. Okay well I came out here I was doing the math and I think I said to you it was 1990 but it must have been 89 my god but I, I came out here first of all because I had a boyfriend that had suggested that we do it. Right. Nice. He was, was he hot? Out to LA. He was. He was hot. He was this classical actor, right? Nice dude. And he was a total. High five. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sort of. Because he was so good looking that he said, "We will go to LA." And I said, "Yes, we will go to LA." And he said, "You go first." <laughs> so, I, you can't hear this, but Pilar is giving me this deep stare. That's right. I, that with that and that deep stare. Where he said, you go first. You know, maybe that should have been a tip-off, right? So I come to L.A., and guess who never showed up? So I was out here without my good-looking classical theater boyfriend. Oh, no. My father had moved out here when I was 14 anyway, so I had a place to stay for a little while. Oh, okay. And I really liked the weather. I had a couple friends from college. They were all film people, of course. Like, they were really film nerds. And I just found myself really liking it. I'd been in Boston beforehand, but out here I really felt like I was at home. Like there's just such a eclectic mix of people and there was so much energy and everybody was creating something or working on something and it didn't matter if you had a straight job or not, which really appealed to me. And so I immediately decided, well, I'll stay here and I'll get a job. And the first job I went for was what I was doing in Boston, which was educational children's theater. Oh, that's, wow. That's what I did for, well, among my many weird performing jobs, I did that for about two years before I came to raise money to come out here. So... I go and I audition for a theater company that's doing this and they I got the job and then they hand me a script and it's all in Spanish. What? Yeah, it's all in Spanish and I was like, uh And, and you they, performed in English. Yeah. That was your audition. Okay. Right. Just checking. Right. Just right. checking. Absolutely. So they I read it and I was like, Oh, this is all in Spanish and they were like, Well, your name is Pilar Alessandra. <laughs> you speak Spanish, right? And look if anybody who could see me, you know, I look very much very Mediterranean, you know. Mm -hmm. Um I am Greek, so it's easy to, to, you know, get confused. And I said, yes, of course I speak Spanish. Because <laughs> I really naturally, needed the job. Naturally, naturally. So I got a friend who did like speak Spanish. It's like that cool rock movie. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I got it. It's an odd movie to reference, but it's what happened. You, you fake it till you make it, you know? And I had a friend who did speak Spanish, translate what the heck I was talking about, which turned out to be water conservation and how to pronounce it. And I went around from school to school teaching and doing this educational theater, a children's theater in Spanish. And that was my first gig out here. And it was better than a straight job, you know? I would do anything not to have a real job. Anything. Oh, man. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Currently, I'm just working at Warner Brothers. And I'm just talking about movies, man. Right. I'm just, <laughs> I don't consider that a real job. I just sure. consider that just me talking to people. It's got to be fun or I can't do it, which is why I teach. I love, love teaching, you know? Love it, but I would not want a desk job. Oh, know? no, no. There's days where in Warner Brothers, they have me in a cubicle and I get anxiety in there. I'm just like, I, I can't do this. And, uh, but every time a person calls, I, <laughs> I just start talking about movies right. and it's fine. You know, and you think of all the people that you meet, you know, and one of those people where you talk about mu movies, you know, might engage with you and it at least turns your day fun, you know? Yeah. I had a straight job for a very short amount of time as an executive assistant, but I was an executive assistant for a media company. They did mm -hmm. radio, radio, oh. um, <laughs> yes, media, radio. Uh, they had a newswire and did something else. And I was the executive assistant that would field all the calls, right? And, you know, I had like my executive assistant costume on, which at the time in the 90s was like, short skirt and heels still, you know? And hammer pants, yes. Right, I was, <laughs> yes, exactly. But what happened was, because it was attached to a news wire, which was right next door, when the Rodney King uh, incident happened. Right. You know, I went into the news wire, all the reporters were gathered around to hear the verdict, and no one could believe it. And the news wire's one black reporter left furious. So they were down a reporter and he had told them, when this breaks, this is gonna be huge. And nobody really listened to him. And so this newswire was understaffed and the riots were almost immediate. You know, mm -hmm. people were angry and they should have been angry yeah, and people were getting thrown out of cars and things were starting to burn. And so the calls overflowed from the newswire into the executive office where I was the person fielding the oh, call. No. And I didn't know anything except like who, what, where, when, <laughs> how, why, you know what Jeez, I was- Jeez, you're stressing me I, out 20 years know, after the fact. I know, so I start, I start writing down all this stuff, you know, and hoping that it's right and stuff like that. But it was a very interesting view, on, a very interesting point of view on something in mm. history. You know, I remember that night coming out really late and the whole, this office was right across the street from where Amoeba Records is, okay? Yes, yes. And I came out and the whole place was abandoned. So you know how busy it is over there. We're talking oh, Sunset yeah, and Vine, yeah, right? Is, yeah, yeah, nothing, no one, crickets, you know, because everybody had sort of retreated. They were all scared. It was like sudden war zone. And, you know, waking up the next day and Ralph's had armed guards in front of it. And, you know, it was just like overnight. It was, wow, this is so interesting and, and scary. And this time. was your first couple years here, right? That was, yeah, just my first couple of years here. Many things happened that should have been like, hey, maybe you should go home. Like the big earthquake happened in 94 mm -hmm. and you have yet to experience one that of that magnitude right. i think we experienced one a couple months ago yeah it was We're, nothing baby yeah, it, that it was, was like 3 a.m in oh the morning my, yeah and people are like did everyone feel the earthquake last night right if and you I'm have like, to no. ask people if they felt it that ain't an earthquake <laughs> let that me tell no. you about an earthquake all right tell us about an earthquake well Pilar. you know it was interesting because i was i was living by myself at that time you know i'd gone through a couple other dating experiences. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I like living by myself. So <laughs> I had a cool place in the Fairfax district on Hayworth. And this happened at four o'clock in the morning. And I did absolutely freak out. It was pitch black. One thing people don't understand is when something like that happens, all the lights go out and you don't realize how dark dark is. And so oh. I immediately got up like, what the hell was that? Ran into a wall, like, <laughs> like a Bugs Bunny movie, <laughs> like boom, just ran into a wall. I called my boyfriend, who was in a band, of course. Of course, yeah. And I was not? like, oh my God, there's, there's, there's an earthquake. What do I do? I'm all alone. What do I do? Right? And he said, he said uh, okay, well, I want you to go over to your freezer. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm going to my freezer. He goes, I want you to open the door. Okay. He goes, I want you to get out your ice cream. Yeah. 
he goes, I want you to eat it all because it's going to melt because all the electricity is off. <laughs> you are no help at all. But I, was like, I thought he said, he was going to say climb into yeah, the freezer yeah, no. like an Indiana no, Jones just, kind of situation. He was just, he was just a, a laid back guy who was high all the time. He was a band guy, right? Yeah. yeah that's what yeah. I get for dating a lead singer in a band, right? So so now I'm still kind of like, oh, I'm all by myself and all this stuff. And then I heard... Were you eating the ice cream? Though? I was eating the ice cream. <laughs> just like a cliche out of like some bad rom-com. A Bridget Jones kind of thing, yeah. And there's aftershocks. I'm getting under my coffee table. I'm you know, calling my mom, who's like, it's early. Why are you calling me? Then finally, what was really cool was, in a very Melrose Place-like way... <laughs> I suddenly heard somebody go, where's Pilar? And this was in my apartment unit that people were making sure everybody was okay. And even though I was all by myself, somebody went, where's Pilar? And these were people, I didn't even know they knew my name because in LA, you know, yeah. you know how it is. Like you meet people, but it can still be a little like, I want to at least have my space, you know? Right. But they knew me somehow and they were making sure I was accounted for came outside everybody was gathered around like a little transistor radio it sounds like in the 50s but the idea was like you know all the electricity was off Mm -hmm. and the internet was not a thing you know like wasn't like we had all social media so we're gathered around this little radio to make sure we heard stuff and we had some candles and stuff because it was still dark and it was like this really cool sort of communal thing and it actually made me want to stay in LA even more that's a fantastic story. <laughs> That's like a triumph of the human spirit. Yeah, it was really neat. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a lot of things have gone down since uh, the past year I've been here. Just with all the shootings and stuff. And, yeah. Uh, Black Lives Matter. And there's a reality show host running for president. I don't know if you heard about this. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, somewhat. Yeah. I... Hillary Clinton is running for president. I don't know if you knew. Oh, she's not a reality show host. Huh? Yeah, yeah, she was. It was called uh, The Osborne. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> That was, I think, another thing about, you know, being in the 90s as far as, like, when Clinton was, the first Clinton was Mm -hmm. elected, you know, we were coming out of a Bush era, and the power that me and my friends felt like we had in our 20s was, I think, very much the power that, you know, Bernie Sanders people feel, which was, oh, my God, we have to get out and vote. We have to. Mm, There has to be a Democrat in the White House, you know? Like, we felt like we got... Clinton in, you mm-hmm. know, like that yeah. for us was the young, vibrant, change candidate and that of was my Barack era. Obama eight years ago. Right, yeah. exactly. When that happened again, I mean, that was just Barack Obama. Oh my God. I had kids by that point, mm-hmm. and I have two daughters. They were around his daughter's age, exactly. Oh. And I woke them up to, to bring them in to watch the inauguration. And my littlest daughter looked at them and said, Mommy, they look just like us. And in that moment, I know it sounds so corny, you know, but to her, yeah, they looked just like her. And I was just like, yes, honey, (laughs) they look just like you. You know, I mean, I just lost it. Why are you crying? You know, so again, I don't mean to anger anybody who is not of of my party. Everyone should just go out and vote regardless. Exactly. And what was also interesting about being this executive secretary at this place for a very small amount of time was it turned out that my boss was working for Jerry Brown, who was at the time a presidential candidate against Bill Clinton. But the thing was, he'd never asked me, you know, (laughs) and every day Jerry Brown would call up and he'd go, hey, it's Jerry, put Tom on the phone, (laughs) right? And every day I got to have the pleasure of going. Was Jerry also Kramer from Seinfeld? He was a little like that. (laughs) Put Tom on the phone. I'm Jerry. Yeah, it was, it was a little, he was a little pissy all the time. And I had the pleasure of every day going, Jerry who? Every day. <laughs> and he'd be like, Jerry Brown, God damn it. Jerry Brown, God damn it. It was, it was great. It was absolutely great. So that, that was fun. And then I quit that job mm-hmm. because I started flirting with the guy who sold us sandwiches. Oh. So he was going to Japan. And I had mm-hmm. had enough of this executive assistant stuff <laughs> and wearing my heels was and my skirt. Was this before or after the band guy? This was, this was before the band guy. I quit my job mm-hmm. and I said, I will take over your route while you go to Japan. And I came back the very next week selling sandwiches to the same place that I was an executive <laughs> assistant. And that was awesome. That was freedom. And yeah, that's how I met the band guy. I haven't really had a straight job since. Sorry to keep going back and forth. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'll... Uh... 
I'll patch it up like some sort of Frankenstein monster. <laughs> <laughs> like an old grandma reminiscing. I feel like that all the time whenever I go home. It's strange because, yeah, a lot of people I've known have kind of moved on from sort of whatever I was doing in high school. And I'm just out here doing my own thing. Like, they're starting families and getting married and whatnot. And it's weird for me because I'm out here. I'm like, don't you guys want to build something that kind of matters? I'm not saying that family doesn't really matter, but at the same time, I feel like they could do so much more and they were talking about doing so much more, yet I'm like one of the few people that have been doing so much more. Here's the thing, because there isn't an either or thing and I do think there comes a stage in life where you go, I had a family and therefore I am now this person and I will never be that person. And I think that you cheat your family when you put your passion aside. Just the way that you're saying, I think they're cheating their passion by putting family yes, first. Yes, that's the word I was looking for, passion. But these things really can happen at the same time. Kids become better people for watching their parents pursue what they love instead of going off to work and hating what they do. Now, mm -hmm. yes, it's, it's sometimes hard to be paid for what you love, but even if you've got that straight job, that at the same time you're trying for your passion, at least watching them watch you try is great. It's not a sacrifice. You really don't have to say, well, now I'm this one person. Right, You right. know, And also, even if it feels temporarily like, yeah, but I gotta give all this time and effort to my kids right now, they're in that stage. Yeah, maybe you do, but it is a long life. And this is again, like our weirdness about getting older. I realized it too, like, oh, you know, like, 50, but I, then I'll be 50 and nothing will have happened to be like, well, you be 50, you can do whatever you want, you know? Yeah. There's this one guy I know, he was a professor over at the University of Queen Mary over in London. He was a theoretical physicist, but then he decided to quit his job and do a band, and his band is like selling out across the country. You can do it, you know, if we live longer now. <laughs> we have modern medicine. There's n nothing that says that you can't try you know, or that you can't pursue. And yeah, I think it, like I said, I think it, it, it cheats your own family when you think that you have to push everything aside just for them. You gotta mm. keep mining whatever it is in you that wants to do that thing. Because even if you're not making money at it, the more you're practicing at it, it's that 10,000 hours, mm -hmm. it will eventually land and it will land in the most unexpected way. Real quick, could you say 10,000 10, hours hour well, theory? You know, yeah. you know that it's sort of a conventional wisdom that it takes sort of 10,000 hours to master something, mm. you know? Yes, and that's right. One of those hours is maybe not making money at it, but you are learning to master it. Eventually, it will be mastered. Eventually, it will land. Maybe the monetary recognition will follow. But I don't know. I, I guess I sound all hearts and flowers, but I do believe that. Oh, well, yeah. This is your beliefs and your <laughs> beliefs, whether they be right or wrong. No, we, I get that point. It's just something I've been struggling with myself. People kind of growing up in different ways and I'm growing up in the career route, quote unquote. Yeah, it's just been something on my mind. Where should we be at each stage in life? And I think when you kind of put numbers to that, that's when it really messes you up in the head. Yeah. Totally does. And, and also when you put should, should according to whom? You know, yeah, yeah. like, oh, I should be doing this. Really? Is Do you have, I don't see a teacher who's assigning you this. I don't see your parents holding your hands and saying you should do anything. So yeah, it happens when it happens. You can say the same thing also even about pursuing relationships. Some people think they have to spend all their time looking for the one, oh, right? Oh yeah, I and, do not like that. Yeah, and it's sort of like, well, now your passion is trying to find a relationship. Whereas a relationship could actually come out of that passion of doing something. And then again, don't turn your back to it. Be like, all right, this is a new adventure, a new story. Let's see where that goes. You know? I, yeah, that's always been one of the things that's really bugged me about society. I hate using that word because it seems like, um, oh man, I'm, we got to stand up to society. But in no sense, society always tells us like, you, you have this one person, you have to meet her and you have to have this family and you have to, get a job kind of working on whatever blue collared work. I guess that stems from, do you remember that Mike Jobs video that was showing around a while back about him saying not following your passions? No, no, tell me about it. Oh, it, well, it's basically him saying like, well, here's the percentages of workers who actually kind of go on with their passions. And I think the American dream should be 
going to the, your normal job, going to your normal blue collar job and contributing to society. Don't follow your passions. Have your passions as a hobby, but not a job. And at first when I saw that video, I was like, okay, well, it's just some reality show star just kind of blabbering on about whatever he makes profit off of. But then it was shown to my brother in school about not following your passions. Uh -huh. And yeah, it was shown to him in a school and by a teacher he respects. That could change his whole life in a really bad way. That's what I'm saying that to him. That is not cool at all. No, no, and I don't want to rag on the teacher, but if the teacher's unhappy with the job and not following his passion, that's his own prerogative. Man. Right, you don't want to ruin everybody's <laughs> life, you know. Yeah. And he said that. It just happened to go, come up in conversation. He was like... Well, yeah, I, I really shouldn't be doing all these passions and I should be focusing in school because my teacher showed me this job about not following your passions and keeping my passions as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, look at me, man. I'm out in LA. I'm also working and doing a podcast. You can do both. It is possible. Absolutely. Just had... Mark Hames on the last show and he talks about getting up early in the morning and sometimes it's maybe putting that other hour into your day but it won't feel like work because it's something you love you know exactly it's like oh yeah that was terrible advice <laughs> god listening to this whole y your teacher is terrible <laughs> I'm sorry sorry no I'm sure there's more to it than that I'm sure there was a a, a, a lesson that the teacher was trying to get at that was more positive that might have been the balance yes, of yes. Yes, I'm but, trying to look at it from his angle. Yeah, but. but man, come on. Come on. You know, like I said, the more passionate you are about something, the more likely you are to make money at it because you're doing all that hard work. Because you happen to want to. You know? I think I'm just going to title this episode Passion. 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 Usually I have like long and annoying titles like the scam radio in our faulty cars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know. Oh, that sure. Is. Yeah, we can go into that real quick. <laughs> no, that's all right. Because the scam radios in our faulty cars. Yeah, yeah. Like our cars breaking down and people trying to scam us. Really? Yeah, because oh. that happened to me. Like my first couple months here, I almost got scammed with the radio scam. And people are like, yep, we're all too familiar with that uh, one. Yeah, my, my husband, you know, when we first met, got scammed with the... Oh, you know that mark you have on your car? Well, here, I'm just going to put some cement on it, and all you have to do <laughs> is take it to a body shop and have them sand it and paint it. You just pay me $100. I'll just fill this in for you. And he actually fell for it. Yeah. Oh. Ah, yeah. God bless you, Pat Francis. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, well. But you also said something very interesting that hooks back into your book. Oh, I, the book? The Coffee Break Screenwriter? Oh, the Coffee Break Screenwriter, available now in <laughs> bookstores everywhere. <laughs> I bring up the book because normally I don't promote people's stuff. In the middle, I usually save that for the end. But I genuinely really like the book. Oh, that's so cool. I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah. And what I got from the book, two things. Just take a little bit of time out of your day, whether it be 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. Right. To do just writing if you're, real, if you're passionate about it. Yeah. If you don't like doing it, probably shouldn't be yeah, doing exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that I got from it is there's no really right way to write a screenplay. There's no right way to do anything. Exactly. And you know, like, it's it's just a way. Or here's a hundred ways. Pick one. Yeah. You do have the books divided into sections, mm -hmm. but they're like, well, this might be the problem with your script. And if it doesn't work like that, then break that rule and go with it. If it feels right, yep. do it. Yeah. And that's what I really admire about sort of your teaching perspective. Like, there is no right or wrong way to do it. Thank you. There is only do. I don't know. Do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> is that what it is? Yes. Do yes. or do not, there is no try. Is yes. That, that's the thing? Okay. That I is the famous get Yoda quote. All mixed up. Maybe oh. it's a fear of eventually I'll looking it to you like every Yoda. Day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. With a motivational poster of Yoda. How bad is it that the film teacher doesn't get her Yoda quotes right? Oh, do you want to hear, like, this is a cool thing about <laughs> being 49, okay, is that I actually saw the first Star Wars in the theater when I was 11 years old. Bam. How about that? That is rad. There you go. All right. Yeah, people were lining up around the block for that theater. Uh, so the, I've heard. Well, the thing, well, yes and no, because my dad just took me to the mall, you know, where the, the movie was. And I was like, what movie are we going to? He goes, it's this cool space thing, you know, and there wasn't 
a line because mm-hmm. the fever hadn't really caught on. It was just the movie that happened to be out. And uh, it rocked my world. You know what? You're going to hate this story. What? But when I was three years old, the first movie I yeah. saw, you know what's coming. It's, I do. It's episode Leave one. Me. It was oh. episode one. But I could see how it would rock a three-year-old's world, of episode course. one. But do you still like it? Or no, is of it? course not. Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Lord. That's what I based my entire writing around is uh, episode one. Yeah, lots but, of dialogue, lots of parallels. But wait a minute. We're talking about your episode one, right? Yes, yes. To like, Phantom Menace. Yeah. Right, okay. Yes. So, yes. yeah, I saw that in the theater and it rocked my world. I'm like, Dad, that was great. He was like, yeah, I suppose so. It's tough. And it's I'm like, is there more of this? He's like, yes, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Here, sit down and study all this stuff. <laughs> We've done that to our own kids. And what's interesting, though, is there is a different pace because, yeah, Pat and I were Star Wars purists, so we sit of them course, down and we're like, course. before we can take you to anything else, you must watch these three, right? But if you look at the, the original, which, like I said, it rocked my world, but it's slow. It is oh, really yeah. slow. And even some of the dialogue and some of the acting is a little like of its time. It's, it's a little, very hokey. Yeah. It is. And you believe in and absorb whatever is in your... I remember showing my daughter, even The Wizard of Oz, which I would mm-hmm. watch religiously every year because it would come on TV <laughs> every single year at around like Easter or whatever. And I'd right. sit down, it would like be an event, right? So I show it to my daughter when she was young and she was like who's that woman with a green paint on her face <laughs> it was just how she saw things because she yeah. could see bad makeup or bad special yeah. effects whereas We're spoiled by the special effects nowadays well and yes and no because i think it's really cool it, it helps you suspend your dis- disbelief even more but it's interesting what the human brain does it will reach so hard to suspend its disbelief that it even gets past bad makeup because that is just the way it is, you know? It's something we've never seen before at that time. Does that make sense? I'm like, like Nope. No, it's just, <laughs> it's, I don't Hopefully know. Hopefully I'll listen back to oh, this all right. and I'll be like, wait a minute. Well, it's, it's the idea that they can see things and, and because they have a more sophisticated way of looking at things, because they have more sophisticated technology, they can see through I see. the I... old bumpy stuff. But I couldn't because I didn't have any references. Yeah, you didn't have anything to relate. It was what it was. So, you know, you go, wow, that's really cool. But I can understand how this generation would like look back and be like, yeah, not so cool. <laughs> kind of <laughs> I look about slow. that with yeah. a lot of my movies that yeah. I used to like. I'm like, what? was that good? Was that good? It's it's powerful nostalgia. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. It is, yeah. But I will say, like, one of the best experiences I had here was, like, taking my dad to see Force Awakens. And we just had a blast. Yeah. It was, it was so fun. That was the last one, right? Yeah, yeah. So I got to take my 11-year-old daughter. Oh. And it was, I loved the movie. I thought it finally, finally, you know. <laughs> oh, God. You know, it was, it was everything that I'd remembered about what made Star Wars good. Mm-hmm. And she loved it. And guess who cried at the end? I cry at the weirdest things. I cry at Obama's election. And I cried at this Star Wars. I do not cry over really sad things. I just cry at this kind of bullshit what, yeah. what's particular it don't worry about spoilers because yeah. it's been out for a year and it's star wars <laughs> if you haven't watched it yet come on well there was one moment i thought was really neat where what's her face the heroine of a ray so she comes on screen and this little kid turned to his dad and said is that princess leah and he said no that's luke and i was like yes luke <laughs> it's not princess leah it was Awesome. I oh, love that. Oh man. So from there on, like even hearing that and then watching my eleven year old's face and I was just like, I'm a puddle. Man, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> that is so amazing. It was cool. Man, I'm just like emotionally exhausted just talking to you about like all these movies and the stuff. Oh, yeah. I, I could talk about movies forever. And obviously you can too. Yeah, I, I love movies and I love I love T V. Uh, what T V are you watching well, right now? Well, one of the reasons I'm looking particularly uh, horrendous today is... She taught, looks great. Don't uh, believe her. I taught a class yesterday and then I went out with some friends and then even though I got home late, I had to watch the hour and a half finale of The Night Of with my husband. Have you seen it? No, not yet. Oh, it's brilliant. It's I, really, really who, who good. Who stars in that? Because originally it was going to be The Sopranos guy, James... Gandolfini? Oh, really? Yeah, Gandolfini, that. yes. I read something about that and unfortunately he passed away, but... Who was the lead guy? 
oh my god i'm like ah uh, yeah we'll, we'll look this I'm, up i'm so bad i mean it's like everybody's shouting at this podcast right now because it's like <laughs> Uh, You're shouting at it for different John, reasons. John Turturro. Oh, yes, yes. that's right. Yes. Oh, Did I say that? I like the fault, fact yeah. that your little young brain is just as bad as mine. That makes me happy. <laughs> happy. But anyway, I, it, it rocks. I just, I just know him as uh, Jesus from Big Lebowski. Ah, yes. And he, was... but, he, but he plays a really convincing... You get lost in the character. You don't look at the actor anymore. I think that's always no, the best no, kind no. of TV. I haven't seen a lot of Coen Brothers movies. I know that's a sin. It's not seen enough Coen Brothers movies. I don't movies. know if it's a sin. I mean, I think Coen Brothers isn't for everybody. Oh, definitely not. You know, and I always think, I don't know, I have my favorites, but they're not everybody else's favorites, you know? And, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I say the movie that you really dislike? What? We can cut it out, but it's Black Swan. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's not Cohen Brothers, thank God. I, I know that's not Cohen Brothers, but Yes. I I'm hate just saying. Black Swan. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> it was every cliche. I like I mean like you've got like for your people who think it's female empowerment, talk I'm gonna do a spoiler, all right? Sure, yeah. Anything go where, you know, the pretty girl swan dives to her death at the end <laughs> is not female really? empowerment. Is that how they ended the movie? Jesus freaking Christ. And like the mother was like it was it was campy. I thought it was like the showgirls for, for ballet. But um, That is harsh criticism and, and right I there. I love ballet. I love it. And I was like, I am so angry right now. But you know, everybody's got a movie that kills them that everybody else likes yeah and i think again that's the beauty of movies when people say to me in class i'm doing this kind of coming of age art project in the vein of black swan my response is great let's see how we can make that the best project that's ever. how we can make it not shitty no, because i <laughs> it, you know i totally respect why people would like any oh, movie okay. it's like so my job is now to make it the best in that genre with that tone it can be not for me to go like i hate that movie you shouldn't get on my class right, like, that's not right, my job yeah. and it was never my job as a story analyst either when i was reading scripts to sit there and go oh yeah just what we need is another sci-fi movie like i would never do that i'd be like all right how can this be the best it could be or how will it how a grip a fan or not you know, and I have to like pretend I was a fan of that genre, even if I mm. wasn't. And that's, you know, I think a good story analyst does as opposed to a shitty story analyst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of my weaknesses when it comes to reading scripts. Mm -hmm. If I'm just not a fan of that genre or anything, it's totally lost on me. You know, but you I have to be. It's like, it's your job, basically, <laughs> is to love and understand story and appreciate all genres, even if you don't get it. Like, you have to actually immerse yourself. Like, what's your least favorite genre? Oh, that's a hard one. I don't think I have a least favorite, because everything, like, I can think of all the movie genres that I'm like, yes, that was a great movie in that genre, because it always does something new and different. I think I just really dislike it when people play up the cliches and such in the genre. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, I don't know, maybe romance, mm -hmm. but... And romance takes a lot of different forms. It could be lethal weapon as a romance. Yeah, lethal weapon is a, a romance between two dudes, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, it's, and I think all the best buddy movies are. You have to look at it with similar beats to, you know, they get each other, they romance each other, they mm -hmm. fall out with each other, and they reunite. You know, there's always sort of that kind of love relationship, and we don't even realize that they're going through the exact same beats as you know, your favorite rom-com. You know? <laughs> yeah, now that I think about it, I don't have a least favorite genre. Mm, that's good. Yeah, every genre has elements of even this current script that I'm working on that I, I don't want to talk too much about with you because I don't want it to make it seem like this is the uh, Pilar Analyzes My Script podcast. <laughs> good, I like being off the clock for a little while, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah. But you can always tell me when we're off. Yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, hint, I'll hint at little things no about problem. it. No problem. I'm going to read it eventually, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't want to give more work to you. We'll see. All right. Originally, it was pitched as a comedy, mm -hmm. 
And as the story was developing, it just got more and more dramatic. It mm. got a lot of more romance in it. I think even a little horror is coming down the line. You know, we're always looking for something fresh within the genre, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's sort of like this familiarity of, oh, that kind of movie, but then it needs that hook, that twist, something we've never seen before. So if that happens to be that your hook or twist is becoming a hybrid of the genre, fine, that's what makes it unique. I would say just make sure that those things meld together that you're not going from one genre suddenly zigzagging into another, oh, zigzagging no. into another, which I've read before. Yeah, and that can be very It's abrupt. a mess. Yeah. It's a bit of a mess because emotionally you're on a ride and then you're saying reset, audience completely reset. Oh, well, yeah. they're carrying all that emotion from that last genre you just tackled. I'm trying to think of a movie that like it really takes you out of it and just in one scene and then it goes back to whatever it's doing. It's funny, it does tend to be like maybe a random scene that shouldn't have been there. Yeah. When you do yeah. catch it, but it's rarely that they've actually just switched genres right in the middle of the whole thing. You know what? I will say, probably shouldn't say it, but I'll say it. Yeah, Suicide no. Squad. That has so many scenes that are just so out of place in that movie. My husband hated it. Pat saw it, my 15 going on 16 year old daughter saw it, she mm -hmm. was mad. They were just mad for completely different reasons, it, but they were mad yeah, about it. Yeah, it has what I like to call the Dark Knight Rises effect, where mm -hmm. you see the movie and you're like, oh yeah, that was a good time. And then afterwards you think about it, which you're not supposed to be doing in movies apparently anymore. Mm -hmm. You think about it and you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. And why was this character doing this in the scene? And, you know, it's not so much that things need to be logical because if you went for that, then you couldn't have aliens land or superheroes at all, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the idea of consistency in a way that you're building up certain patterns within the actual movie that people are learning. They're learning along the way, going, oh, that's the rule of that character. Exactly. You suddenly yeah. break that rule without thought. People go, wait a minute, you spent all that time developing that rule, now you're breaking it. You know, mm. I, I'm getting impatient here. It doesn't, that's where the logic starts to go. A exactly, exactly. It's just making rules for the world. Yeah. Sorry, what was I talking about before this? Because I, I wanted to say something. I don't yeah, know. it just. It's brilliant, I, though. <laughs> Hmm. A Suicide Squad makes me mad. Uh, uh, the end. <laughs> <laughs> Love Gage. <laughs> Love Gage. P.S. Um, don't fire me, Warner Brother. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that, no. Look, what I heard you say was it made you think, right? Ah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's right. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's very clever. You always twisting it on its head. There you Not go. Not flipping it on its head. That's yeah. right. Spinning, baby. Yeah. Spinning. You're very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if I showed you my script and you totally hated it, you would be like, well, I like this and this. And then you would tell me all the problems and then compliment sandwich it and then give me one last thing. And I'll walk away being like, wow, my script is fantastic. Yeah, you're <laughs> on to me a little bit. But ultimately my job is I have to tell you the truth because if you pay, course, if you pay yeah. somebody for their analysis mm -hmm. or they claim to be good at their analysis, it better be truthful because otherwise you're going to go out with a shitty oh, script yeah, and make so you everybody look bad. I know a few yes men in my life mm -hmm. and I try to keep them away from my, my stuff because they like it regardless of what it is. Right. Gotta be careful about those yes men. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, it's true. It's hard to, LA And the is, movie yes men. LA, <laughs> LA is kind of the, I think where people do get impatient with it is it's the world of yes. Mm -hmm. So people say yes, and then they shake their head no, or they say yes, and you don't hear from them or whatever. But I think you have to be reading the subtext sometimes. You know, mm, yeah. um, and sometimes it's not a full-throated yes. It's a sure. That sounds great, or yeah, well done, or that, those sound like half my Tinder experiences. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hey, would you like to go out for coffee? Yes, that sounds great. Okay, what time? Unmatched. There we go. <laughs> it's tough. So the world of Tinder, that is where I do feel a hundred years old. Because I'm yeah. like, wow, what is that? Where you can sit there and swipe a picture and then... Yeah, like totally in disregard a... a whole person and just one finger movement. That's, like, I find that both horrifying and incredibly appealing at the same time. <laughs> like, wow, that would have saved me a lot of work. But, like, what happens after you swipe? Then you, then you start talking? Because... 
Yeah. Fortunately, well, I don't know this because I am married. Cause sure. If I yeah. really was an expert on this, we'd have to worry about me, right? But <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, oops. I'm sorry. I no, just, it's fine. I just swiped your microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's swiping left to this I podcast, am. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so what happens? What happens after that? Sure. All right. Well, after you swipe right, yeah. and the other person swipe right, you say, "Hey, I think we're both." Hopefully, you read their description and uh -huh. you think they're intelligent or or maybe they're just hot and you talk and you say hey hello my name is gage and they say hello my name is so and so and then you talk about what i always talk about is like things in descriptions and i'm like oh so you're a fan of this and this i also kind of do podcasts on the side yada 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 and eventually that leads to a number and eventually that leads to a meeting and eventually that leads to hooking up. Wait, what, what did I say? Oh, look, that's <laughs> great. In my day, we just started with a hookup. There you go. <laughs> oh, the good old day. <laughs> I don't think you're that old. I just sound so old. old talking. Like, you know, it was funny though. I think I was telling you this, that the height of desperation for my contemporaries mm -hmm. was Oh my God, I think they went on one of those dating sites online. <laughs> like that was, it was new and it was only for the desperate. It was like, I can't believe it's come to that. You know, <laughs> as opposed to like, it's it's the norm. Yeah, it's the norm. Now, it is weird because it's almost still like that point of desperation if people like go on the computer, log into a website and like online date. But if it's on your phone, it's fine because you're just swiping right and left. Because it's, it's just cooler yeah. if you can hold it. In it's, your hand. it's just cooler. Like, yeah, I just see this one girl. Whatever, I'll just put her in my pocket. <laughs> is that funny? Like, it wh is. what we attribute as cool as like if you're sitting down, you're that's so strange, right? But if you're on the move and you're swiping on your phone, right, that means you're actively doing something else, right? Exactly. It doesn't mean that you're just you've given up and you've gone into your. <laughs> Hubble, I guess. I think those matchmaking acts, ass, for, uh, ass, the ma matchmaking ass is still. Might, max, what? Matchmaking ass? Is that Sorry. what you just said? Matchmaking apps. Oh, apps. All right, got those, it. Those, uh, I still think those are desperate, <laughs> but I, it's more socially acceptable for some reason. Mm, I guess, so, I guess. Yeah, that is a strange thing. Yeah, uh, like I said, it makes me intensely curious about it and really glad I'm not doing it at the same time. So. I'm glad, you, you got that locked down, girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I think we should be wrapping up soon. All yeah. right. Yeah. Anything else you want to know about the old days of the 90s, Sonny? The, Any the 90s. <laughs> what was it like when I was born? When was oh, the exact day? Oh, my God. How many parades were oh there? <laughs> I believe there was some sky writing going on, if I remember what? right. It was like gauge in the sky. We're like, what, what? is that? What is that? <laughs> it was a momentous day for everyone. It really was, yes. <laughs> when was I born? Oh my <laughs> God, you're killing me. Killing me, kid. Oh, but I'm glad I was on your show. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, you are. <laughs> you were absolutely lovely. Thank you. And I had a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah, me too. Me and, too. It's nice just talking. And I think your daughter is calling because you left her. Oh my God. Oh, it's somebody. Who cares? Oh, okay. okay. It's somebody. <laughs> I thought it was your daughter. I'm like, are we over time? Not yet. We are doing fine. Yes. Here I am in a podcast talking about your passion and I have to cut it short because I have to go pick up my teenage daughter yeah. from school. Yes. Yeah. I <laughs> the last thing about that, I just wanted to say that I didn't mean like if you're starting a family or whatever, you're not passionate about something. I'm saying if you're, I don't even want to say content. If you're just striving for uh, being in a family and that's it, then I think you should strive for a little bit more. Yeah. Just remember you can multitask. Yeah, and, exactly. But you got to know that there are certain people who are like, their passion might be for eating a family. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I feel a little bit insensitive. As soon as I said that, I'm like, that was insensitive. No, I mean, it can be its own art, its own creativity. You are creating, you know, a family unit, an economic unit, life all that kind of stuff, you know, and there is something really cool about watching, like I'm watching these two people that I just happen <laughs> to give birth to just turn into very interesting human beings. There's something really cool about that. But I do agree, it is not either or. If you think you need to put something away, you never have to put it away. You don't have to put it away for a relationship. You don't have to do it for a family. Your passion always is there and pursuable. And you'll eventually land at what you love and you'll actually be making money for it eventually too. I didn't land at this career until I was in my early 30s. 
So I had all of my 20s to have bad relationship and make painful mistakes and do jobs in Spanish when I didn't even speak <laughs> the language. I mean, you have lots and lots of time and eventually it'll all come together and, and be something. Pilar, that was an excellent final thought. I think <laughs> best final thought we've had on the show in quite a while. Thank you. My final thought, go watch Kubo and the Two Strings in theaters now. Cool. Also, yeah, pick up the Coffee Break screenwriter. And if you want to hear Mark Hames who wrote Kubo and the Two Strings, he's on the On the Page podcast this week. And listen to On the Page. And of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's a he's an old buddy who I met in my 20s. So Right on. There you go. Everybody you know now is going to you know, is going to be your colleague and mentor and that person you know later. Perfect. <laughs> I love it. Do you have any way you want to end this? No, you can just tell everybody to go to onthepage.tv. That is the catch-all for everything. I think the you podcast. just did. Yeah. I think you just there did. There you go. <laughs> All right. This is Pilar and Gage signing off. Okay, so I just got finished listening to the podcast uh, i guess that's the this is the scenario that we're rolling with right <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah okay so yeah i had a lovely interview with pilar you definitely did so first thing i just want to mention which is just a recurring theme on our podcast and i always thought that it was a result of the guests that we had on but all of our guests tend to have this youthful attitude about them and having pilar on the podcast was the perfect example of this because here's a woman that self-describes as an old folk. She said she's in her, this point, by the time we release this podcast, she might be... She'll be 50. She'll be 50. So she kept on doing her old woman voice and, and joking about that. But throughout the whole entire thing, I kept on reflecting on the fact that she retains so much youthful exuberance, so much livelihood. She seems like she always has a new thought on her mind and that's so cool yeah yeah that's what i kept saying to her she's been doing a podcast for nine years so she knows how to carry a conversation and like keep the audience entertained absolutely like, even if you're just like talking to her she's not just like slow and sluggish but she's just very on point and on the ball if you hadn't noticed during the interview i was just nervous the whole time because she kept throwing things at me yeah i mean she's also compared to us she's definitely a veteran of the format and so oh, she, hell yeah. she is a guru in that sense. Yeah, just even compared to maybe some of our people that we brought on the podcast, she may even out them. They're almost half her <laughs> age. I don't have any examples to give, but I, I know sometimes I come onto the yeah, podcast. Yeah, you're not going to call any of our previous guests out, are no, you? No, 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 no. I mean, I might even just relate it to myself sometimes, but she seems to have more energy than I do, and I'm half her age. And that's amazing. That's absolutely incredible to, to say that. And that just goes to show what doing something that you love and being passionate about your job can give you that youthful energy. And that's amazing. And I definitely learned a lot about being passionate and about being right and wrong. Because that's, honestly, that's something I've been struggling with recently. Trying to find that balance between being passionate about relationships or being passionate about your work or kind of being a realist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot from her during that interview. Yeah, so she also, I mean, I guess her closing statement encapsulated it pretty well where there was this, and I've actually been dealing with this issue. I'm pretty sure a lot of kids in our situation uh, and age group are dealing with the same kind of ideas of where did we see ourselves being in either a job market or a relationship market or what at this day and age? Where do we see ourselves and where we are now? And did we meet those expectations? Do we feel like we should be somewhere else, but we're not. She said something to the effect of like, you know, who is setting these goals? Is someone holding your hand? Is someone saying like, this is where you should be? Um, and there's not. There's not a guidebook. There's not a rule book to all of this. That's really cool. No, no, no. I was talking to her about this before, and I think I mentioned it in the podcast. That's part of the concept of being an almost adult. You're, everyone is constantly growing up at their own rate. I mean, someone might be married at our age but at the same time they might not be exercising creatively or it could be vice versa they could be really successful in their career but just single and miserable and wanting to find love or something right i mean you have these people that have gotten married have started a family and maybe they hadn't completely pursued their career path 
and in that respect maybe they're in a job that they're not so satisfied with but in the end maybe their family they're raising their kids maybe that becomes their passion and that is a perfectly acceptable route to go if that's what ends up happening exactly exactly and to quote mclaur the numbers don't matter the numbers don't <laughs> matter yeah in the end it doesn't really matter what kind of salary you're bringing in if you have enough to put food on the table keep a roof over your heads what more can you really ask for exactly just be happy while doing it exactly yeah as long as you're passionate about what you do in whatever capacity i have to commend you first of all for the way you you reached out in order to meet her you always have this ability to have no fear when approaching even some big name people it's exactly what she said what's the worst they can say no mm -hmm. if they say no then it's no just move on to the next person or just say thank you i appreciate you giving the time right a problem that i i tend to always have and whether or not this is due to like overactive imagination or something but i think a lot of people deal with this too is we tend to overthink things we tend to think wow you know if i contact this person they're too busy for me they're not going to have enough time to give up to something like that but if you go about it in a way that's not intrusive you just want to go out for a cup of coffee i mean obviously you were surprised she said yes and you guys struck up a conversation and now exactly she's been incredibly nice to me over this past year so we love you pilar <laughs> much love yeah, hopefully in the in the future, if we ever bring her back on, or even just have a Skype conversation with her, that would be incredible. I would I would love to meet her in a <laughs> I guess still in a digital <laughs> medium, but at least have a conversation with her briefly. Yeah, John Claude, come over sometime. True. Yeah. It, once I scrounge enough money, I'll I'll come and visit you in Cali, and I'll be able to meet Colleen Lindell and and Pilar Alessandra and all of your other good <laughs> friends out there. If you do end up coming out here, we'll we'll do something fun like a like a little vlog adventure or something. Yeah, that would be interesting. Almost adults the traveling series. And by the way, I just got this news this morning on Twitter. You were also tagged in it. Real quick, I want to shout out before I forget. I want to shout out my friend Brett Lunch Please or Quack Billion. He is listening to the podcast while he's animating. Oh, so all right. I'm glad we could help you. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt the flow. Of no, 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 you didn't interrupt the flow at all. I, I saw that on Twitter earlier, and I was also very, very happy, especially that we had an animator that was listening to our podcast. That strikes we have very home. so many animators listening to our podcasts. Yeah, maybe we should do, uh, I mean, we already did a couple animators on our podcast, but uh, maybe I well, should we'll do We'll have animator. more. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, going back to Pilar. Anyways, to cut back and to just say thank you to Pilar for coming on the episode. It was a pleasure to listen to you. It was great. It was a wonderful podcast. <laughs> um, you had a lot of insightful comments, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you possibly in the future. Yeah, come back anytime. John claude do you have any final thoughts on this entire shindig? Wow. I just have to reiterate what she says. If you're in a spot right now where you feel like you're not where you should be at this point in time, just kind of take stock of all the cool things that have happened who you are as a person the skills that you've acquired you know appreciate that you are exactly where you should be and who knows where you'll be in another year perfect perfect so that was the best final thought by john claude and pilar and i have still yet to have a insightful final thought <laughs> thank you good night <laughs>